Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. I welcome you to the Bible study once again today in Jesus' name. Let's pray together as we begin. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you very much for the Bible study today. Thank you, Lord, because every time we come, your spirit enlightens us. And you open the pages of the scriptures so that we can get your very mind for this hour, for this moment. Therefore, Lord, we're praying that today as we come again to study your word, that your word will be made clear and plain to every heart in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We come to the study of the word of God again today. We have been studying the book of Revelation. As you know, we've studied chapter 1. And we have now studied completed chapter 2. Now we come to the beginning of chapter 3. And the Lord is speaking to his church. He's speaking to the seven churches of Asia Minor. But in the message he had for the seven churches in Asia Minor, is ending every message with, He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. We have studied four of the churches. And today... We come to number 5, Revelation chapter 3. I'm reading to you from verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, This thing says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Here the Lord was speaking to the church, the church in Sardis. And in speaking to this church in Sardis, he's speaking to many, many other churches in our generation today. Because there are many churches that have been named to live. And yet, those churches with the evaluation of the Lord Jesus Christ are dead. When you think about church, you think about life. You think about eternal life. And actually when you think about that popular verse of scripture. John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You remember the words of Jesus Christ. The theme cometh not but for to steal, to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and life abundant. When you think of what Jesus said concerning life, abundant life, eternal life, you understand the church should be alive. We cannot serve the living God if we are dead, spiritually dead. Unfortunately for this church we're looking at today, the only thing the Lord could say about them in the very first verse is that you have a name, a name to live, a name that you are alive, a name that you are dynamic, but you are dead. To start with, let's understand we're serving a living God. In first Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we arch unto you. And now ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. Therefore, we shouldn't be talking about spiritual death. In the church, we should be talking about life so that we serve the true and the living God. In John chapter 17 verse 2, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And when you think about a church, a church is the assembly of people that have life eternal, eternal life, abundant life, Christ-like life. And when they come together, they should be alive in the Lord. But unfortunately for this church we're reading about, it says you have a name, that you are alive. But alas, you are dead. I want to bring it to you, everyone here today. Make sure that you are not dead. That you are not just a Christian in name. So that the church is not just a church in name. But it will be a church alive. Or the life of God. The life of Christ within. How do we have that? When you receive the Lord Jesus Christ. 
as your personal savior, then he takes away all those things that symbolize death, spiritual death, and he gives you life eternal. First John chapter 5, reading from verse 11. And this is a record that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. When you receive that son, you make him your Lord and Savior. The life in the son comes into you. When the son comes into you in verse 12, he that has the son has life. And he that has not the son has not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that she may know that she have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Let's come back to Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things, says he, that has the seven spirits, uh, the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast the name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name. Before my father and before his angels. He concludes by telling us, reminding us once again, it's not just a message to the church in Sardis, it's a me message to all the churches and to every Christian in all the churches. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. You look at the evaluation of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning this church. There's something you can tell. The evaluation, evaluation of Christ. Concerning this church would have been so very different from the evaluation of themselves or the evaluation of the world around them. You know that many Christians, most Christians in fact, and most churches, they are full of self-praise. They think they are alive. They think they are dynamic. They think they are praiseworthy. In fact, they will publicize and sing their own praise before other churches. But what's the scripture telling us in Proverbs chapter 20? I'm reading to you from verse 6. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. It's unwise then. And it's very, very deceptive not to listen to the evaluation of the Lord and to be praising ourselves. Self-praise comes out of unrealistic false comparison from a proud heart. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Isn't that what churches do today? Instead of the church comparing itself with the command of the Lord, the demand of the Lord, the desire of the Lord, and the picture that the Lord paints concerning the church in the New Testament, they do not compare themselves with the Bible standard. They compare themselves with one another. Our church is not doing bad. We're better than that other church. It's like somebody who is sick of, you know, cancer is saying, well, I know I'm sick of cancer, I know I'm dying, but I'm better than that other fellow that is dying of HIV AIDS. Death is death. You have a terminal disease and you are dying. And so comparing yourself with another person that is dying and saying that my disease, at least I know that my disease is not, uh, is not a terrible one, although I'm dying, I'm better than the other dying fellow. That's not the point. Come back to life. 
You see those churches and even Christians that are comparing themselves with other Christians are better than brother so and so. I'm better than sister so and so. That's not the point. It is this wrong attitude that results in self satisfaction and complacency. And it can make us to be blind to reality until we blindly plunge ourselves into eternal darkness, eternal doom, and eternal perdition. The church in Sardis had a name of being alive, being lively, being dynamic. The church had a good reputation. The world around and all the people that did not see were the eyes of Christ. They did not see any sign of spiritual sickness or spiritual death. We must not let the praise of man deceive us into thinking that we are praiseworthy because others say everything is all right. Self-praise or the praise of men are equally deceptive. Because the Bible says it's not he that commends himself that is approved of God, but whom the Lord commended. You know, that was the attitude of the Pharisees and, and those religious people in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 16. Reading there in verse 15. And he said unto them, Ye are they. We justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. You see, when you praise yourself and you think that you are doing fine, you are doing well. You understand that God may not be saying that you are doing well. Listen to the Spirit of God. In fact, here is what you will notice generally. The world condemns the people that the Lord commends. Because it's the way of the people of the world to appreciate the things that shouldn't be appreciated. In Ezekiel chapter 13, I'm reading verse 22. Because with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad. That's the way of the world. Those who are righteous in the sight of the Lord, the world will condemn them. And the world will make the righteous sad. Whom I have not made sad. And strengthened the hands of the wicked. That he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. And that's what happened to the church in Sardis. Let's come back. The church in Sardis. It was a church that had a name that it lived. But alas, it was dead. The study today is titled, The Challenge of Reviving a Dead Church. There are three points uh, we're going to consider. Number one, the deception and deterioration in a dead church. Number two, divine directives to a dying church. Number three, divine declaration to devoted Christians. Let's come back to number one. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 1, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things, says he, that has the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. Why don't you stop there for a moment? The Lord Jesus Christ introduces himself here. And the way he introduced himself is that he has the seven spirits of God. That's the introduction he gave to that church right there. He tells us in John chapter 3, reading from verse 34. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. That is, he didn't just have a little portion, a moderate portion, a big portion. He had the fullness, immeasurable spirit of God. That's what he meant when he said, here is the one that has the seven spirit of God. And then he says, and the seven stars. He has the seven stars in his hand. For the benefit of those who have not uh, heard about this before, look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 20. The mystery. Of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. And Jesus said, I have those stars, those leaders, those angels of the churches, I have them right in my hand. 
So we know that he who has the fullness of the Spirit of God will know all the deep and hidden things in the church. He knows them completely. He knows them perfectly. Because it is a spirit that searches all things, even the deep things of God. He knows all things concerning the seven stars. That is, he knows all things concerning all the leaders in all the churches in all the ages. Now, to show that he knows, he now begins to tell the church their condition and their spiritual situation. I continue from the middle part of verse 3. I know thy works. He always said that to all the churches. He always said, I know thy works. There's nothing you can hide from the Lord. I know thy works. He said that to every church. He's saying that to every Christian. And he's saying that to you today. That he knows whether you are born again or not. Apart from the testimony. Apart from, I am alive. I have Jesus Christ. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. It says beyond all your profession. I know thy works. And then he wanted to tell them now the diagnosis of that church. The revelation concerning that church. It says that thou hast a name. That thou livest and art dead. What does that mean brothers and sisters? When Jesus said you have a name that you are alive but you are dead. When it says they were dead. You understand what it means? Ephesians chapter 2. Reading from verse 1. And you were see quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Sin kills spiritual life. If these people in studies, if they ever knew the Lord Jesus Christ before, they had allowed sin in their lives. And the sin they allowed in their lives had killed the spiritual life they had. When sin comes in, the life of Christ, life eternal goes out, and then that individual becomes dead. In Romans chapter 8, from verse 6, For to be so silly minded is death. They had become carnal. They were planning like men. You understand? What? Even like people that were not born again. Although they were saying, yes, I'm born again. I'm a child of God. Quicken Jesus Christ. Dead him. I'm following the Lord. I'm, I'm part of the militant sin profession. And they were carnally minded. And it is, if they ever carnally minded, it's death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. No, neither indeed can be. So then, then that it are in the flesh cannot please God. That was their condition. But it wasn't just that they were dead on their own. They were also mixing with the people that were dead. They were visiting the congregation of the dead. What happened in Sardis is this. These people will come to church. Already, life eternal was uh, fading away. Already, the life of Christ was fading away. They were becoming lukewarm and cold. And the real energy of the spirit was not operating in their lives anymore. And then they will visit other places. Where they were not even worshipping God at all, at all. And when they did that, as they visited the congregation of the dead, in those pagan places all around them, what happens is that those who were dying actually totally became dead. In Proverbs chapter 21, verse 16, the man that wanders out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. And there are times that you find people, they come to church here, and instead of listening to the word of God, and what they have had, take it to the Lord in prayer, on their knees, so that the fire of God can come upon the altar of their hearts again, so that the life of Christ can come and wake them up once again. Instead of that, they will live here, and then they'll be visiting congregations of the dead, where the life of Christ and the teaching that brings life is not being proclaimed. And so they find themselves like what we have read here in Proverbs chapter 21 verse 16. The man that wandereth out of the way. Those wanderers. Wanderers. They wander here. They wander there. They wander there. On Sunday, they come back here. During the week, they start wandering again to the congregation of the dead. 
and the little life in them, ready to die. Eventually, the lamp is blown off, and the little life is gone because he visits and remains in the congregation of the dead. Those people, look at what Jude is saying about them. Jude, verse 12. It says, these are sports in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Proverbs chapter thoughts they are without water. Carried about with winds. Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit. Listen to this, twice dead. Plucked up by the roots. It tells us actually, and I've told you in the word of God, that it is when sin enters in. That that sin takes the life of God away from you. Sin kills. Sin destroys. And sin brings to death those who are alive before. In Romans chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 9. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. This man was still alive in the physical. But the point is, when sin entered in, the sin that you allow is a sin that takes away the spiritual life out of you. When we say sin, what does that mean? Because many people, they just hear sin, sin, sin. And they say, well, thank God, there's no sin in my life. Ah, are you sure? Romans chapter 1, verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, that's it wickedness covetousness maliciousness full of envy murder debate deceit malignity whisperers those tail bearers don't tell them that i told you backbiters haters of god despiteful proud boasters inventors of evil things disobedient to parents without understanding covenant breakers without natural affection implacable or merciful who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death not only do the same but have pleasure in them that do them and you will see then that when sin comes in any of those sins that are enumerated there spiritual life will go away there will be spiritual death so then you understand that it is this that the word of God is talking about, that uh, they are the name that they live and they die. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 6. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. That's the word from the Bible. And that was inspired of the spirit of God. In Luke chapter 15 verse 13 Luke chapter 15 verse 13 And not many days after The younger son gathered all together And took his journey into a far country And there wasted his substance with us living In verse 24 For this my son was dead And is alive again This my son was dead And is alive again That's what Jesus said I know your works that thou hast a name that thou leavest and art dead. The members in that church did not know themselves as much as Jesus Christ knew them. They professed to have the true spiritual life, but they were spiritually dead. By the way, what causes spiritual death in a Christian? And what causes spiritual death in a church? Number one, self-righteousness and self-satisfaction. Number two, carnality and fleshly lusts. Carnality and fleshly lusts. Number three, interaction with dead, worldly churches. Number four, neglect of the watch of life. It brings death. Number five, disregarding the spirit of life. That's the spirit of power and the spirit of resurrection. Number six, unconfessed sin and undisciplined backsliders. Number seven, worldliness and worldly pleasures. Number eight, unequal yokes and friendship with the world. Number nine, uh, you have seeking to win the world without feeding the church. Number ten, perpetual insensitivity to Christ's correction. When the Lord is saying, it's not right, that's not proper. 
you shouldn't talk like that you shouldn't live like that you shouldn't go that way and you are perpetually insensitive to the correction of the lord it brings spiritual death number 11 allowing persecution and the ridicule of people to uproot you from your solid foundation and then number 12 continually taking the lord's supper unworthily that thing will bring spiritual death eventually i go to point number two divine directives to a dying church after the lord had said sadis church here is your condition then he began to give them directives commandments as to what they ought to do and what they ought to be revelation chapter 3 verse 2 be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for i have not found thy works perfect before god remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent if therefore thou shalt not watch i will come on thee as a thief suddenly unannounced and thou shalt not know what hour i come upon thee uh, can you see the directives of the lord here not all of them in this church in studies were spiritually dead there were those who still remained alive but they were also going down the line they were ready to die it was a dying church not all dead but dying the call of christ to everyone in that church was to be watchful to be on the alert to be vigilant and to take note of the signs and the state of spiritual sickness which may eventually result in spiritual death if not taken care of promptly and adequately and appropriately the pastor and the leader in that church uh, was to strengthen the things that remained that were ready to die and was to do that with love with warm and inspiring exhortation and with encouragement with the promises of god that pastor also endeavored to minister to that dying church in the power of the quickening spirit because the lord said pastor leader i have not found your works perfect before god this revelation should stir you up to seek more grace so that you'll work and serve the lord acceptably and then the lord said remember therefore how thou hast received and heard hold fast and repent each christian in the church was to remember how they received the gospel with love with devotion with ardor and they were to hold fast the whole truth that the church had received and they were called to repentance which means that they will turn away from everything that can cause spiritual death and they were to embrace life and practical holiness in christ that's the demand of the lord the lord said if they didn't repent that will attract divine wrath and severe judgment on them and look at those things that jesus said six things number one be watchful number two strengthen the things that remain number three go on to perfection because have not found your work perfect in the sight of the lord number four remember how you have received number five hold fast number six turn around repent number one be watchful and the lord was calling this church the leader here he was calling him to two kinds of vigilance number one personal vigilance number two pastoral vigilance in matthew chapter 24 reading from verse 42 watch therefore for ye know not what hour your lord does come but know this that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come he would have watched and would not have suffered this house to be broken up therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the son of man cometh the lord was saying watch watch personally watch and then you must have pastoral watching too in verse 45 who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season blessed is that servant whom his lord when he cometh shall find so doing verily i say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods luke chapter 21 verse 34 and take ye to yourselves 
lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the care of this life. It says, in your watchfulness, be very careful. You see those who take alcohol and they become drunk. They cannot watch. They forget themselves. And the Lord is saying, you take care of yourself too, so that the things of this world and the cares of this life will not intoxicate you like alcohol and the money you have and the position you have and the children you have got, and the wife you have married, and the husband you have, and the good things of the life that you have will not intoxicate you like alcohol. And then you forget there is a heaven to gain and a hell to escape. It says so that they come upon you unawares. In verse 35, for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. He told that man, he said, watch, number two. He said, strengthen the things that remain. If there's any responsibility that a pastor has over the church, a leader has over the people of God, is to strengthen them in the Lord. He said, strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. You see, that was the practice of the early church. Acts of the Apostles chapter 18 verse 23. It says, and after he had spent some time there, he departed and he went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order strengthening all the disciples. Do we do that today? House fellowship leader, do you do that? Zona leader, do you do that? Women representatives, do we do that? And the coordinators, do we do that? And our group coordinators that ought to go from district to district to district, do we do that? Or do we only go there when there's a problem you want to put up the problem? Or do you go around strengthening, strengthening, strengthening the disciples? He went all over, all the country all the community, all the provinces of Galatia and Phrygia in order, in a systematic way, strengthening all the disciples. That's the commandment of the Lord. In Luke chapter 22, reading from verse 32, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Number three, perfect those imperfections. Call them to perfection. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, I'm reading to you from verse 10. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. The Lord is saying, I have not found your work, your ministry perfect in the sight of the Lord. Therefore, make sure that you do everything necessary, everything possible to perfect that which is lacking in the faith of the people. And that's what Paul the Apostle determined, decided he was going to do. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Uh, those are the people that knew the meaning of ministry. Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salutes you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Number four, the church was to remember. Remember how thou hast received and heard. It was not to follow the new fad or the new doctrine or the new thing that is coming up with all these mushroom churches and assemblies that are coming up. It was to look back and remember how he received and heard. And that's what the Lord is challenging you and I to every time. To always look back and see how you received in Jude verse 17. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't forget, recall, bring it to mind again. This is the way we started. This is what we got. This was a fire burning within our soul. Remember how you received and how you heard. Revelation chapter 2 verse 5. Please remember. Please remember how it was. What you got when you came in. Remember? 
Therefore, from whence thou art fallen, repent and do the first works. Another thing they were told is that they should hold fast. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. It says, don't let it go. Other people will be playing with sound doctrine and they'll be following the system of the new generation churches. Prosperity, prayer, deliverance, miracle, singing, worship, just that. But the Lord is saying, remember what you got before. Remember what you were taught. Hold each fast. Don't let anybody take it away from you. Revelation chapter 3 verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown. And then he now said, after you've seen all this, there's something I'm calling you to. And it is to repent. It's calling the people of God. The people of God that have not kept their life vibrant, vigorous, as it ought to be. And they had not been as vigilant as they ought to be. He called them to repentance. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And that's the call of the Lord. He was calling those uh, people in Sardis and he's calling us today. All those people that had a name that they lived, but they were dead. He was calling them to real life, vigorous life, vibrant life in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jeremiah chapter 3, reading from verse 12, go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, return thou backsliding Israel, says the Lord, I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, says the Lord, and I will not keep mine anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. And ye have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, says the Lord. For I am married unto you. I will take you one of a city and two of a family. And I will bring you to Zion. And the Lord was telling them that they ought to repent. You see these people that already they were dead. Or many of them were dying. And the Lord was calling them back to life. Ephesians chapter 5 reading from verse 11 and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light for whatsoever does make manifest is light here comes what the Lord wants us to do. Wherefore he says, Awake, thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. After giving them the directives, expecting that those who had ears to hear will hear, and that they will be obedient, he now made a divine declaration to devoted Christians. Point number three, divine declaration to devoted Christians, I come to Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 4. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis. You know, that word, even in Sardis. It says, well, although there are many people there, they are ready to die. There are other people there, they have been named, that they live, but they are dead. But even in that situation, even in that place, you still have a few names. And which have not defiled their garments. The garment here is uh, talking about the garment of righteousness. It's the character of the believer as we are washed in the blood of the Lamb. It says they have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. It says they are worthy. They are worthy of my commendation. 
They are worthy of walking with me. They are worthy of coming to heaven because they have kept their garments. And they are worthy of the crown. Then in verse 5 it says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I'm even going to exchange the white raiment they have now, the garment of righteousness they have now. I'm going to give them an eternal one. I'm going to give them the one that they can never lose. That is the white raiment as a reward when they get to heaven. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. It says their names are now in the book of life because they are born again. And if they keep on walking with me in righteousness, in true holiness, I will not blot out their names out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. The Lord is telling us that we need to keep our garments because that's what the Lord is looking at so that we'll not walk in darkness and we'll not walk naked and be ashamed on that final day. Revelation chapter 16, I'm reading to you from verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. When the Lord announced, behold, I'm coming as a thief, it means I'll come suddenly. If you want to repent, this is the moment to repent. When I come, you'll not have any chance. It will be so sudden, you might be unprepared. I'm coming and it will not be announced. If you're going to prepare and you're going to wash your garments white, this is the time. Behold, I come as a thief. It says, you can take it definitely from me. I am coming. I am coming. But the hour, the time, you will not know. Blessed is he that watches. Is vigilant. Is watching. Personal vigilance. Pastoral vigilance. That keepeth his garments. Well, let's say walk naked. Let's see his shame. The Lord is telling us then that we must keep the garment of righteousness. That purity. That holy thing the Lord has given us, the holy experience, the holiness experience, we must keep it until it comes. In Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. How do you make yourselves ready? By watching. By straining the things that remain ready to die. By perfecting the things that are not perfect yet. By remembering what you have received and going back to it and holding fast unto what the Lord had given you. By repenting. If there's something to repent of, that's how you get yourself ready. And it says the wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And it says unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it says unto me, These are the true saints of God. As you look at what the Lord Jesus Christ said to that church, he said, the people that have not defiled their garments, they are worthy. They will walk with me in white, but you remain vigilant. You are looking up to the Lord so that he will not come upon you unawares. In Jude, reading from verse 20, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves keep yourselves don't wonder about keep yourselves don't fall into sin keep yourselves don't yield to temptation keep yourselves in the love of god looking for the mercy of our lord jesus christ unto eternal life so then the lord wants us to make sure that we keep ourselves and of some have compassion making a difference on others save with fear that is saying that even the evangelism that you are doing do it with fear don't let the people you are trying to evangelize pull you down into their sin save them with fear pulling them out of the fire hating even the garment spotted by the flesh that you don't allow them to lure you into evil while you are trying to help them uh, to come back to know the Lord. These people that remain worthy and you do not soil or, or make unclean their garments said they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. Uh, look at the fulfillment of that promise in Revelation chapter 7 reading from verse 9. After this I beheld 
And lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, and, and they stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. These were the victorious people. These were the people that eventually they make it to heaven, clothed with white robes and palms of victory in their hand, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which seateth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and about and the four beasts, the living creatures. And they fell down before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Let the church say, and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? That's it again. White robes had been given to them. And it says, Whence are they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, a day before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto the living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes that's why the Lord is telling us that we should make sure that we are found worthy my brother my sister it takes an effort you cannot just relax and you know just uh, not read the Bible not pray not come to Bible study not act on the word of God you are hearing and then you'll be worthy no it takes an effort for you to be worthy in Luke chapter 21 verse 36 watch ye therefore and pray always that she may be accounted worthy watch ye therefore the careless fellow is not watching the one that talks anyhow is not watching the one that goes to just any party every party is not watching and the one that is mixing with the world without understanding the effect of the world on your christian life you are not watching watch ye therefore and pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man then you see the promise that the lord gave there he said if you're watching if you're vigilant if you remember if you're strengthening and if you keep your garment white and clean i will not blot out your name out of the book of life which means that if you are not watching and you allow sin to come in then your name will not be in the book of life will be removed look at exodus chapter 32 I'm reading from verse 32. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. That's the book of life where the believers names are written. And the Lord said unto Moses, whosoever, high priest, priest, Levite, Israelite, Gentile, anyone, whosoever disciple in this church in any other church whosoever preacher hearer worshiper member of any church whosoever have sinned against me him will i blot out of my book now when the name is blotted out of the book of life if the name doesn't get back there by repentance what happens on the final day hey, look at it yourself in revelation chapter 20 verse 11 and i saw a great white throne and him that sat on it and from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and i saw the dead small and great young and old stand before god and the books were open and another book was opened which is the book of life 
And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, in the plural, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Here is a terrifying information, instruction. Here is a thing that should make you to tremble before the Lord. And whosoever, preacher, a member of any church, charismatic or Pentecostal, evangelical or orthodox, a man or a woman, whosoever was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire in revelation chapter 21 verse 27 and there shall in no wise enter into it enter into heaven anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination nor or maketh a lie but they which are reaching in the lamb's book of life and then as the lord concluded the message that he gave to this church in sardis the lord jesus said for those who are watching for those who strengthen themselves in the lord and for those who make perfect the things that are imperfect and the people that remember how they have received and they have heard and they go back to that thing they repent and they hold fast the faith unto the end these people that are keeping their garments white and these people that allow their names to remain in the book of life because they are worthy he says they'll walk with him in white he'll not blot out their names out of the book of life then he said i will confess the name their name before my father and before his angels what an encouragement for us that whatever is happening persecution tribulation trial whatever it is you remain with the lord so that on that final day when the lord will approve of the people that will get to heaven before the heavenly father he will confess your name before his father and before the holy angels in luke chapter 12 verse 8 and verse 9 also i say unto you whosoever shall confess me before men him shall the son of man also confess before the angels of god but he that denies me before men in the time of temptation in the time of trial in the time of tribulation in a time of persecution in a time of need in a time of opposition, whosoever shall deny me before men, him he will deny, shall be denied before the angels of God. To this dying church, the people that have not defiled themselves or defiled their garments, had some encouragement from the Lord. What a great challenge for these people to even remain in that church where many, many people were dying spiritually. And it was a great contamination, but they had not been defiled thereby. They maintained their holiness and purity in the midst of sinful backsliding people. They kept their garments, their robes of righteousness clean and white, unsoiled with all the worldly fields around them. They were vigilant. They were doubly watchful. And in that environment, they were keeping themselves by prayer and by dependence upon the abundance of the grace of God. They kept walking worthy of the vocation wherewith they had been called. And they were counted worthy to escape all the things that shall come to pass so that they will be able to stand before the Son of Man. And the Lord is making that same opportunity available for you today. That you too, you'll examine your life and you'll find out am i just professing that i know the lord is it that i'm a christian in name is it that we're a family a christian family by name or is it that we really have the life of christ and the life of god within us your garments of righteousness are they pure are they clean are they white or are they dirty already or is it just motion of religion 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 without righteousness is your name in the book of life or is your name out of the book of life it's infinitely better and it's an 
eternally higher honor to have your name remain in the book of life than to have your name in splendid catalog of princes and poets and warriors and scientists and nobles and statesmen that this world has produced. Well, blessed are those people that are overcomers. And when you remain an overcomer and your name remains in the book of life, then when the trumpet shall sound, when he comes suddenly, unannounced, as a thief in the night, then you'll be with the Lord. The Lord has spoken to you today, and the Lord is now telling you, he that has an ear to hear. Do you have an ear to hear? Do you have an ear to hear? He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. Then rise up and show the Lord you have heard. Show the Lord you have ears to hear. Show the Lord you are serious about your Christian life. That you are not just coming to the Bible study just to come. That you are not just there. You have heard. You have listened. And you are giving yourself to the Lord. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He has spoken to you. Take those words back to the Lord again and say, Lord, I don't want to be a carnal person, a nominal Christian. I don't want to be just alive in name. I want to have the real life of Christ in me. And I want to possess...